Hi, this is an interview with Professor Stephen Erdely, and interviewed by Forrest Larson. It's March 24th, 1999, and we're in the Lewis Music Library. Steve is here today to um, talk about first the um, his his career at at, um, at MIT, and we'll also touch on his um, growing up in in Hungary and his education there, some of his ethnomusicological work and his performing career, and other things as they arise. So, I want to get some background as it pertains to your work at MIT, but also just some of your, your, your professional background as far as your musical training and education, um, and various things like that. You want to just give us a little overview of that. I came to uh, uh, MIT, I was engaged um, in 1973, um, and the time uh, I have spent here represents, uh, I would say, sort of the, uh, the fourth phase of my uh, musical career. Um, it was not the first uh, job uh, which I did hold, having come through Europe, uh, making a living in Europe and then um, entering the United States in 1949. Uh, my Really my first job was as a performing musician uh, with the Cleveland Orchestra um, where I stayed till 1966 from 1950-51 to 1966, and having obtained uh, a second doctorate uh, at Case Western Re Reserve University, um, I entered the teaching profession in 1966 at Ohio State University, and then after Ohio University, I was engaged to come to uh, start to introduce certain courses at MIT. Um, so, um, this uh, sort of represents a fourth, as I said, fourth phase of my career, um, and um, uh, many things which happened here at MIT, and my contribution, if I can say uh, that I did any, um, are the results of previous attainments in my own musical profession. So, um, can you tell me just a little bit more about some of your your um, your musical training? You know, um, um, you know, prior to, to coming here and your your first doctorate. And well, um, my musical training is uh, has also uh, developed or unfolded uh, in several stages. I would say that uh, the first stage was um, I received my first training in my own hometown, which was in Szeged, in the town of Szeged, Hungary, um, a southern uh, provincial town, uh, which at the time I was born and uh, have grown as a, a young kid, has seen some very, very interesting uh, musical development uh, uh, due to the people who have been at the time a uh, cultural leaders of the town. Then um, after I received my uh, final degree at the uh, high school, um, I entered the uh, uh, Music Academy in Budapest and the uh, Franz Liszt University. Um, and that was sort of uh, the higher degree which I earned. My life then was interrupted uh, during the German invasion uh, in 1944. I have been imprisoned and after my liberation in uh, uh, Germany and uh, close to Munich, um, I entered again the profession as soon as my health and my strength was regained. 
Um, and I felt uh, that after the war I need still a little bit of more of a guidance and I decided to, um, uh, to go to a, <coughs> a fine violinist at the time, a concertizing uh, violinist who, with whom I had a relationship more or less like um, a, a tutor would have to um, his disciple. Uh, and he uh, could listen to uh, some of my performances, uh, to some of my radio broadcasts, as well as give private instructions. So I would say this was a kind of a postgraduate education. When I came to the United States and I, I uh, was engaged to play with uh, George Sell in the Cleveland Orchestra, um, I felt uh, that um, uh, I would not like to stay in the orchestra forever uh, because conductors come and go and once you attained a, a wonderful performance and high class performance with a conductor like George uh, uh, to start again and learn the repertory with somebody who himself is uh, at time learning, learning the repertory I would be too much and, and so I decided um, I would like to get more a teaching job but I found over the years and that, that did take quite a number of years that nobody wanted to talk to me unless I have an American degree. So in 1957 while still a member of the orchestra I uh, approached uh, Case Western Reserve University and presented my credentials from Europe and they gave me um, accreditation of a past master degree and they permitted me to take uh, so many courses and if possible to write a doctoral dissertation. This sounded very good, nevertheless uh, it took me still five years to complete the uh, requirements toward the uh, PhD. So I would say that this, this uh, represents then the third or fourth stage of my musical education because I got my second doctorate in 1962. And that was in ethnomusicology, right? Yeah, uh, well, uh, it was, uh, the dissertation was in ethnomusicology, but uh, at the time ethnomusicology was a very, very uh, young discipline in the United States. Uh, the society was formed in um, 1956, the way I remember, uh, at a meeting of the American Anthropological Society and as a branch of the American Anthropological Society. And then it started to uh, <coughs> recruit members who were interested um, in music and anthropology ma mainly. Um, and um, by 1960 or so, the first meetings started. So when I joined the society in 1960, uh, on the invitation of um, its uh, president at the time, uh, Alan Merriam, uh, who was an anthropologist himself, we had in our first meeting only about 40 members. So it was an, an, a rather an, a small but very strongly decided group and the journal that uh, was formed and the first articles then appeared uh, in the journals and then the society started to grow. The word ethnomusicology was concocted by, um, I think, Jaap Kunst, um, a Dutch uh, anthropologist, musician, and, and folklorist whose work was mainly uh, in Javanese music. Uh, but by that time, ethnomusicology was in existence in various different forms. Um, in Europe, uh, in Hungary in particular, where we had Bartók and Kodai starting folk music research, uh, we called the field musical folklore studies. Um, and in Berlin, where Hornbostel and his disciples um, have started the field, it was comparative musicology. So um, uh, 
that was all before the word ethnomusicology has been concocted. So um, in 1962 then uh, uh, when I faced the question of what should my dissertation subject be, um, I had two choices at the time to do something in my own field uh, which was uh, violin music and violin literature or I should do something which was new at the time and nobody uh, really uh, was fully uh, <coughs> informed uh, what has happened in the field <coughs> of musical folklore research in Hungary, what particular uh, contribution Bartók and Kodai made in general to this broad field of oral uh, musical literature. And so I decided that I'm writing my dissertation on these two men and their particular contribution and that was the way um, I became what you would call an ethnomusicologist. Mm -hmm. This is the dissertation. A little book which uh, 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 the dissertation which dealt with somewhat different subjects uh, um, basically dealt with uh, the ethnic background of, of the nation uh, and uh, the research, comparative research which the two folklorists have been doing and their particular uh, achievements in various stages of the musical folklore research was uh, at that time of great interest to Indiana University and before actually my dissertation was accepted at Case Western Reserve University, Indiana University already decided to publish it. And that was your book, Methods and Principles of Hungarian Ethnomusicology? Yeah. Yes. That's, That's quite right. a book. Um, well, uh, it, uh, I look at it as a, as a little book today. Uh, it um, it's, uh, ends uh, with researches in up till about uh, uh, World War II. Um, <clears throat> but it has been very useful and I'm very happy to say that even uh, this last uh, musicological uh, conference in Boston, uh, several people came to me uh, when they saw my name and, and told me uh, how much they uh, profited from reading that little book and understanding what Hungarian ethnomusicology was all about at, at the outset of this, which I see, which I find uh, rather rewarding, and I'm happy about that. That's great. Wow. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that um, after finishing your your PhD at Case Western, you spent some time at Ohio State University. I went to school there. Yeah. I got my musicology degree from there. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what you what you did there briefly, and then we'll get on to some MIT stuff. But I'm curious. Well. Um, it, uh, the, uh, my, my landing at Ohio State University, I must be very honest and, uh, and um, uh, straightforward about this, was, I would say, almost a mistake. Um, I was searching to obtain a job and uh, my degree in ethnomusicology was um, something plus because many universities started to develop at the time oral history programs um, and um, um, the conductor Handel who has been the uh, uh, director of uh, um, Eastman's uh, School of Music um, and Rochester University um, called me and wanted me to open an ethnomusicology department at Eastman School, which it didn't have at the time. It had some library facilities, but it didn't have any music. And it was in, in 1966, February, we were on a tour uh, with the Cleveland Orchestra, and so um, I stepped out for, for a half day uh, in Rochester, and I had my interview with the faculty. Uh, and everything went very well. And then um, um, I, I was supposed to give an answer to sell whether I will stay for next year with the orchestra or not, or I will resign. By that time I had my PhD for four years, and during those four years the, the market 
to obtain a job was so bad and so difficult that, that uh, I could not land anywhere. So this was, uh, to me, a wonderful chance, really, to start an ethnomusicology program and in the field I, I was uh, interested in. Uh, and I was waiting and waiting for uh, uh, Handel to give me the answer. Um, and the answer, unfortunately, never came, but finally Sal cornered me uh, on the corridor and asked me, when will you give me an answer? So I had to... <laughs> I had to make up my mind whether I want to stay with the orchestra or I take a chance that Eastman School will come through um, uh, with the answer. And um, in a week or so, I said, well, sorry, I have to resign. I have to take this chance. After all, I have my PhD. I should be able to, to get a position. Well, we went then we went on a tour uh, at, throughout the country, and it was somewhere in Colorado or in further uh, to the west uh, that I received a <coughs> letter from my wife which was wet from the tears uh, that um, uh, Handel informed me that the uh, budget for an ethnomusicology position has not been okayed um, at Eastman School of Music and so the job has fallen. That, of course, meant that between two chairs I was on the, on the ground. I was, of course, at that point um, uh, searching to obtain another position, and it was very, very difficult. Interest was there, but the money and the position was not there. And finally, <coughs> toward the end of the summer, um, and the Toledo University turned from a city university into a branch of the Ohio State University. And they needed people. And they engaged both of us, my wife, uh, uh, who taught piano there, and me, who was supposed to teach courses. Well, this was uh, at least uh, a life-saving situation. And I... Um, we moved to, uh, to Toledo, we had a very nice little place and I, uh, the faculty seemed to be very pleasant, but soon or later I turned it, it, it happened that uh, we entered a political beehive uh, at the university. And the more we did to improve or uh, create new courses and perform and, and, and bring in um, uh, music to, uh, to the university life, the worse it is has gotten for us. Uh, the uh, politics was, was uh, impossible. So I could not move out from the university and finally I uh, um, was ready to resign even if I don't have any other position. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden some other possibilities opened up, and one, of course, was uh, MIT, which saved me from uh, complete nervous breakdown and, and professional breakdown. And so that's the way I came, and that was my life, uh, my uh, biblical years <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, of suffering at uh, Ohio University. Oh, that was Ohio and not Ohio State University. It was Ohio State University, but yes. It became Ohio State University because it got its foundations from yeah. Ohio State. Yeah, but I didn't know that, that Toledo University had had become part of, of um, Ohio yes, State because it it's, not, it's not anymore. Um, well, uh, uh, it's Bowling Green and Ohio, both were Ohio State Universities. I yeah. think they are still. They, well, they in Bowling that Green, that's Ohio University now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh. uh, when I was there, it was Ohio mm -hmm. State, and it got its funds from, from the state, and that's the yeah. reason. And there's the Ohio University state. of Toledo now, so it, yeah. it, it must have um, separated it uh, uh, later on. I don't know. That's, I didn't know that. That's, that's very interesting. So was MIT looking for an ethnomusicologist when they hired you? Well, MIT was looking to improve and, and increase uh, its courses and, and uh, were looking for, uh, for people. Uh, and um, um, 
when uh, when I came here, uh, um, they looked at my background. And that wasn't at the time ethnomusicology, which delighted them at all. Um, but uh, most mostly my background as a performer and as a PhD in musicology, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, they had composers on the faculty, but uh, uh, the uh, musicologist was at the time Rufus Hallmark, who did not yet receive his PhD degree. Uh, and there was, ethnomusicology was completely unknown to, mm -hmm. uh, to the faculty and its usefulness in, in that year at MIT. So it was uh, not immediately that I could really persuade the faculty to introduce ethnomusicology courses. Mm -hmm. uh, it, would, it did take uh, some years before they realized that there is some merit um, in studying the um, oral aspect of musical traditions. Was there somebody at MIT who particularly recruited you that, that asked you to come? That well, uh, the faculty uh, interviewed me, and yeah. and and it was, to my understanding, it was a general consent mm -hmm. uh, that I should be hired. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it hurt. It, it happened very quickly. It, it uh, um, I came, I think, uh, at the first or second of July. And by July 4th or 5th, I had the job. Wow. wow. So um, it was not, um, I, and, and I talked to everybody. I, at that time, the people who have been here uh, were John Buttrick, who was the chairman, uh, David Epstein, uh, John Harbison, and uh, Barry Verko. Uh, these were, at the time, on professorial ranks. Right. Uh, uh, who have been talked to me, and I did talk to anybody else. But we, we were a very small faculty at That's the time. Right. The first faculty meetings had about uh, six people or so present, not more. Wow. wow. Well, the name Klaus Liebmann um, is, um, resonates a lot even still with, with people here. Did you know him at all? Well, uh, Klaus Liebmann uh, just resigned at the time, mm -hmm. um, and he was um, uh, called back to teach, I think, one course. Um, and um, during uh, that period, we became very friendly, uh, and uh, um, we had lots of talks together, and he told me a great deal about um, how uh, he developed, actually, music at MIT from practically nothing. Uh, That's an incredible and, and, story. <laughs> well, I'm sure you know that story, so I don't have to repeat it. Yeah. Um, he, was, um, he was a pioneer, actually, to uh, um, introduce into a school of technology the entire subject of music. Uh, we felt, uh, even in 73, that that music was still regarded as it was appreciated as an art, but it was regarded as a uh, with certain suspicion that music can become an academic subject as such. Mm -hmm. And Klaus Liebmann's book, he mentions that that was even a problem at other universities, even such as Yale. He had he had even mentioned that there was problems. It had a particular manifestation at MIT, but he was saying that he found that that conflict of music being accepted, even at, at particularly performing music um, at, at other, other universities. And, um, well, um, it, this was, in, indeed, it was generally true of, uh, of the university situation uh, that uh, music uh, was an art, but uh, uh, it's um, uh, scholarly or academic uh, um, merits have been a little appreciated uh, or a little recognized by people who were in some other field sciences because they just could not possibly relate any kind of scientific investigation to music. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, by that time, when all these this, uh, um, uh, opinions were uh, voiced or, or uh, politics was voiced, uh, we had already considerable scientific achievements, particularly uh, in bringing oral music and oral history mm -hmm. into the uh, overall 
framework of music history per se. But uh, again, uh, here we felt that um, uh, musicologists who uh, finally attained some standing and recognition in university uh, jobs uh, were very strongly objecting to uh, anything which related to, to the oral history, which actually cannot be um, substantiated with written documentation. Right. Right? It has to be substantiated through recordings and whatnot. Right. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the musical climate when you came to MIT? What was the, you know, what kind of concerts there were, and just the, the general feeling for, you know, what music was going on here? Well, uh, I must say that uh, uh, the reception and uh, the academic um, standard at MIT was uh, so much higher than anything else I expected or I have seen in other universities that it was to me surprising in spite of the fact that uh, we have been here confronting a little bit of a fight to a uh, to get our music department growing and, and to accept some of the new courses which we wanted to introduce. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> the performances um, and the entire program uh, was uh, supported very, very generously. Uh, it was, of course, um, President Wiesner at the time who uh, uh, had uh, a soft spot for, for music and for art, and um, uh, the kind of, of donations which we received for, for programs, for instruments, for, for library, uh, were quite considerable uh, in relation to, uh, to some of the other universities which already had a music department mm -hmm. and were struggling with obtaining budgets from their boards. Mm -hmm. Well, people have commented, even looking at the resources we have in the music library here, they say that for um, the kind of music program that is, it is at MIT, they find it surprising. And, um, and I guess it was those visionary people in the, from, from the past who saw that it really needed the kind of support that it had. And There, there was uh, uh, enormous interest in music uh, on the part of the faculty. Uh, I met with several faculty members. One of our dear friend and neighbor uh, was Professor Den Hartog, uh, who was uh, um, a, a great scientist and, and a great teacher, appreciated here. Um, and um, uh, we developed a close friendship and he showed me at home that um, he uh, had, over the years, he had regular chamber music evenings in his house. As a matter of fact, uh, he had, uh, for a string part, that he had all the four instruments in his house, so in case <laughs> guests came uh, uh, from some other town, he could invite them, they didn't have their instrument, he could give them an instrument wow. to play chamber music. And he had a, a beautiful uh, home, uh, quite ideal to, to perform and to play uh, chamber music works, and so were many others. Uh, who were very much interested. Uh, when we started to play our first concerts and series of concerts, our average audiences were over 500 people. At one point we have had close to 1,000 people and I remember that uh, one winter uh, it was a snowstorm um, and uh, we just came in uh, to play the concert and to our, our greatest surprise, the house was uh, three-quarter full, the Kresge Auditorium was three-quarter full. So that wow. was the interest at wow. the time. So you did a lot of performing when you were here? Oh, I did yeah. uh, over 35 yeah. concerts, yeah. so uh, recitals with my yeah. wife, yeah. Now, did, did you do any other um, performing like with um, like other kinds of chamber music or coaching or conducting as well? Uh, well, I know my job assignment was uh, not chamber music. This has been for this, uh, um, Marcus Thompson has been hired and uh, I wanted to keep out of his... So uh, he was hired about the same time that you came there. He was hired as a performer and then he started the chamber music program and, and I had 
uh, no interest of interfering with his particular mm -hmm. area of territory. I had enough uh, territory on my own to make my existence here uh, worthwhile. Yeah, did you do any performing with him? We didn't perform together, no. Yeah, yeah. No. You were also the chair of the uh, the music section for a while. Was it around? Um, well, I was I was elected from 1976 to 1981. I was uh, uh, heading the uh, music section. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was there anything from from that time period stuff that you did that you you feel particularly good about or? Just things that you that you did in that capacity. Well, as I mentioned to you, I would like to uh, discuss that maybe at another time, okay. uh, mm -hmm. when uh, we have uh, all the documentations, and I can uh, refer because mm -hmm. uh, I have an, an yeah. enormous pile of letters and and documents and programs and whatnot, which uh, which were initiated at the time. Mm -hmm. When I was reading um, Klaus Liebmann's book, he goes into to great detail about his philosophy of of music's place at MIT. It's a very interesting and nuanced um, position. Some of it surprised me, but I was really impressed with his thoughtfulness. Is there any kind of general um, kind of philosophy that you had when you were here and what how you saw music um, music courses and a music curriculum at MIT? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, every year or two uh, we had to reevaluate our programs, not only in general but also in great detail. And uh, uh, I had to formulate uh, the uh, future visions for the program uh, in uh, reports which I presented to the visiting committee. So uh, many of these ideas. Uh, were set down in these reports, which then uh, were sent to um, the president or through the visiting committee to, to the board. Um, naturally, many of these programs sometimes required some support, financial support, and, and increase of library uh, facilities uh, or increase of, of uh, uh, equipment facilities which we needed. Uh, one of the most important things which I um, uh, emphasized at the time, which I felt very important, uh, was an ear training program, which I introduced uh, here. Uh, and um, I felt that uh, uh, well, there is a, a kind of, of uh, um, a great enthusiasm to uh, to listen to music and even to play music, but there is very little understanding of what music is all about, mm -hmm. and particularly in the uh, general student uh, groups, even among people who came then into these ear training courses, I felt that some of them had five, six, even ten years of, of piano studies, and they could not identify a little melody like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star from the page, uh, mm -hmm. if they have seen one. So uh, to um, to hear music uh, sing from the page was uh, was a very important consideration. And I still feel that this is a kind of education which is generally lacking from the general American musical education. Mm -hmm. Well, that ear training course that you put together uh, was was quite something because when I came to the music library, we were still that was still being used um, when you when you were teaching the music fundamentals course, and I can remember the the students saying how hard some of those tapes were. <laughs> well, it was um, uh, gradually yeah. developing, yeah. and since I had only the opportunity to teach it for one semester, I I had to. Uh, uh, push the curriculum pretty hard so that when they finish one semester they can go into uh, the theory program from that point on. Uh, the um, uh, idea and the philosophy be, was entirely based uh, on Kodai's syst Kodai system and idea. Mm -hmm. Kodai had one basic saying which I felt is so important and so deeply uh, rooted uh, 
in music education, he said that um, uh, you uh, have to uh, hear what you see and to see what you hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. So, um, I, it occurred to me last night when I was thinking about some of these questions, your, the, the, this, your training course, and I was thinking it probably had some relationship with your training as an ethnomusicologist as far as your interest in oral skills. And I can see the connection there with, with Kodai coming out of that. And, um, that's that's true because um, uh, my experiences with uh, um, musical folklore studies go back way back uh, to um, uh, to my uh, early high school years. We sp we speak about high school when we uh, reach the age of eleven, and yeah. we are in high school from eleven to eighteen. So I was about uh, 13 or 14 years old when uh, my first theory teacher, um, who was first generation Kodai student in composition, um, uh, carried me into neighboring villages in my uh, uh, hometown. Um, and um, uh, he went to collect uh, folk music from villagers and taught me uh, how to actually notate uh, the songs as we hear them, as, as the villagers are singing. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was a, a very good experience for me to, uh, to start to visualize what I hear on paper. Right. Uh, and that remained, of course, with me because that, that skill then refined as we went on. and, and and it was used, of course, greater uh, extent when I, I became more involved in theoretical studies. So your interest in ethnomusicology goes way back. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Are, as I yeah. said, we, we yeah. started. Uh, uh, we called it musical folklore studies, and, and musical folklore studies in Hungary began in 1905. Yeah. Uh, so when I came already on the scene, there was two generations already. Uh, uh, folklorists who have been trained yeah. uh, and exposed to uh, to Kodai's and Bartok's principles, and and uh, uh, it was a very important aspect already at time of, of theoretical teaching and studies. When getting back to to MIT, um, tell me about some of the, um, the guest artists, scholars, and performers that came that that um, that you remember that um, you might want to tell me a little bit about? Well, um, um, there were too many to uh, uh, Yeah. To, uh, <laughs> uh, any that, over the years. Uh, in the average, uh, we had about 70, between 70 and 80 uh, uh, concert performances at MIT. That included faculty recitals, guest uh, recitals, uh, and um, some, of the, some of the lectures. Our office had to uh, prepare and organize these events. Uh, of course, included the uh, orchestra performances, the choral right. society performances, etc., etc. Uh, so uh, every year we had a number of uh, internationally uh, known artists who came and played their recitals here, um, and uh, we had first-rate um, lecturers who who gave their um, subjects or, or expertise um, airing. Well, I can only uh, mention just a few names offhand. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Henry Lang has been here. Uh, Carl Geiringer has been here among the musicologists. Um, and um, uh, several of the uh, European um, uh, scholars who came to the United States, um, Balin Sharashi, uh, um, uh, uh, George Crow, um, they are all uh, well represented in our library by their books and by their yeah. studies. Uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And mm -hmm. I would have to see the programs sure. in order to give you a whole detail because there were uh, dozens of uh, uh, 
great performers here. And mm -hmm. of course, among the uh, 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 performers, Shandor Vig, who has given here a uh, whole weeks of of seminars and uh, string quartet playing and play two recitals, one with the orchestra and one on his own. Wow. Yeah, so we had many people. And when I was reading Klaus Liebmann's book, you know, that, um, that tradition of bringing internationally recognized artists goes way back and, and that continues today and that's, that's really something. Yeah. Well, it's it, it's part of uh, of of the overall picture. It's mm -hmm. not uh, uh, it's important to have a great artist uh, so that the student should have some form of comparison uh, of where they are and 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 what the ultimate achievement is in the performance. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, they sort of get a little bit of a wrong picture of their importance and 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 their genius. Yeah. Well, Klaus in his book mentioned that that they needed a standard you know, um, and yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. that that was basically uh, uh, the um, overall thinking of, of the faculty here mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, Klaus's great contribution was that he uh, he stuck it out uh, he had difficult times uh, to uh, to start uh, with uh, music performance organizations and then uh, with the, uh, gradually uh, introducing uh, a music appreciation course and, and trying to get a foothold in the academic field. Uh, all that gradually establishing uh, and then having people come uh, and support him in this field was, was actually his, his uh, achievement. And mm -hmm. uh, we can call him the father of, of music uh, at MIT, indeed. Were there any students that you remember that, that, that kind of stand out in your mind? Uh, uh, I have been teaching um, all the way through uh, large classes, and uh, it's difficult for me to, uh, to single out one mm -hmm. because I did not have them uh, I did not have the students for a succession of classes. Mm -hmm. uh, they could come uh, to my classes maybe for for ear training and then for some other uh, uh, courses. But it was in, in my teaching situation. It was not one of of successive teaching. Like mm -hmm. for instance, a theory teacher yeah. has a student for three or four years or right. something like that. Yeah. The um, the concerts in the music library. Um, I, I never, um, by the time I came, those had, had pretty much gone. What, were the, what was that like with the, the concerts here in the music library? It's, it's kind of hard to imagine what that was like. And well, uh, uh, the music library was uh, just one of, uh, one of the areas where uh, certain concerts could be held. Mm -hmm. um, it was resisted uh, a while because it meant that this... Uh, uh, middle room, this, this large room had to be upset and, and chairs and everything had to be brought in. Um, but eventually there was a piano and it was, uh, it was replacing, uh, replaced actually by um, Killian, Hall. Killian Hall. Right. Um, but uh, it served about the same purpose. There, there were not that many concerts, only at times when um, maybe Kresge or everything was too occupied and our student recitals were performed uh, here in the library. For a while we also had wonderful concerts in, in front of in the courtyard. In the summertime I, I, mm. I have uh, uh -huh. introduced a series of concerts in the courtyard and that was very, very successful. Uh, uh, it was always full and we used uh, uh, this uh, little uh, extension in front of the windows as the podium right. uh, and we had uh, the piano was anyhow in the library so it was easy to get out uh, the acoustics was fine except for here and there some disturbance by the airplanes yeah. uh, which flew over MIT but um, uh, uh, at the summer everybody appreciated it was open uh, the problem was uh, with uh, the chairs and setting up the chairs. We needed some 400 chairs 
which we had to gather from every part of MIT, and then we had to hire the people who, who would uh, bring it or, or fold it together after the concerts and whatnot. So it was, um, it was a very successful uh, uh, program, uh, but um, it did cost us some money. And since the concerts were free, we could not get any revenues to, to cover our expenses. What are some of your memories of the music library when you came? The, the, the collection, the staff, the librarians? And all well, that? Um, the music library was a very, very fine library. I was amazed uh, to find how many uh, excellent things uh, were already uh, collected when we um, arrived. And, and that is, uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I have to attribute that to to my predecessors uh, uh, who have gotten money. Uh, Lipman has gotten money. David Epstein has gotten a, a considerable sum uh, to buy uh, certain collections uh, for music. Uh, that there were certain areas where, where the music library was deficient is, is obvious. And we just had to uh, work gradually and, and uh, um, skillfully that, that some of these areas should be gradually built up. And where the budget was not sufficient, not enough, well, we had to use our uh, uh, diplomatic tact of approaching the other sources to get here and there a thousand or two thousand dollar donation for the library. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the, it was a solid basis and to build further uh, on, on that solid basis we had to use just common sense. Um, but I know that for instance uh, uh, reading sometimes uh, in the past about uh, music uh, and uh, music in America by Jacques Barzin, a little book, yeah. um, he has in one page, he said, um, uh, universities are now doing a great deal. And um, he visited MIT and went into the library and he found with great amazement how good that little library is <laughs> for general purposes, which was true, which was mm -hmm. absolutely true. We did not suffer any uh, basic problems or shortages in the library for our particular courses. But as our courses have been going, we naturally needed uh, more music and we needed more uh, more books and, uh, and then more equipment. Right. Who was the music librarian when you came? Was it... Um, Linda Eileen? Solo. Linda, Linda Solo, Solo was there. Yeah. yeah. Did you remember Eileen Borland all? Borland no, and that all. was before, probably yeah. before my time. Okay. Um, well, she died last year, and yeah. um, we'd like to find out more about, about her. her. Yeah, yeah, but it was yeah. Linda Solo. Yes. Yeah. Um, any Im impressions or memories of her that that, that stand out in your mind? Well, she was a she was a wonderful librarian and and um, a, a great friend. She was very very solid. She was very knowledgeable uh, and very strict. Uh, she was ready to hit our hands if we touch something. <laughs> uh, was not to be. Uh, but she was very, very good. She was a real, well-trained music librarian. That was, we, we were um, uh, sorry to see her go, but we were happy to see her get married. Yeah. Well, to this day, I still feel like her legacy lives on because she had very well-defined collections policies, you know, that today we still follow a lot of those. And she yeah. really set a real, a real vision and a real scholarly vision for the, the music library that I... I yeah, well, uh, we relied on her expertise uh, and we discussed with her many times the areas where the library needs some further uh, improvement or, or growth. She was a great help. Yeah. Well, one subject, and maybe we should wait for this um, next time, but um, we've actually had students coming into the library asking about this recently. Um, there's going to be a conference at the end of this semester on um, over at the Media Lab on the... Um, in some part of the conference is going to be dealing with um, the history of electronic music at MIT, and I know that Barry Verco was on the music faculty when you were here. Um, 
Is there anything you want to, you could talk about now? Just some even some some general stuff about how how that that got started and or anything. Well, I suppose uh, Barry would be in a better position mm -hmm. to to speak about the history of uh, uh, um, um, technology and music, uh, but um, um, he. Um, uh, he was always interested in these two particular fields and he had courses in technology and music when the Media Lab was not yet established. Right. Uh, and um, um, then eventually um, um, the, uh, the computer music and, and whatnot, which, which, which he actually started to develop, and the first concerts which he organized in Kresge Auditorium, were extremely interesting. Well, all this was, I suppose, was uh, somewhat the legacy of his Princetonian uh, background and, and uh, Milton Babbitt's uh, possible influence on, uh, on the developments here. Um, both uh, Dean Hannam and, um, and uh, we have been supporting uh, Barry, but then uh, eventually uh, the support which the humanities could give uh, technology was not sufficient and, and uh, a new institution, so a, a department had to be established which had its own particular budget and where all these requirements, what the uh, technology needed, could be satisfied. And so that was kind of how the Media Lab got started uh, that's in some ways. That was where the Media yeah. Lab actually uh, uh, okay. President Wiesner was uh, very much interested that something of that sort uh, should should develop in not only in musical line but in many other fields. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, before we close this part of the interview, are there any other things, just kind of in general, that you you want to um, to talk about, or did you have any any questions? For me, or anything like that, or, or just things that maybe I haven't touched on that, of a, of a general nature with music at MIT. Um, I really don't have. Um, I'm I'm here to answer questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ask okay. Questions, but yes. I just wondered if there was if there is some area that I I may have a general topic that I may have have not touched on. Well, uh, the only thing is that we have today uh, just an absolutely beautiful library here, and um, um, being the beneficiary of this, this library and the holdings, I'm very happy with what we have here. Uh, sometimes uh, my research, of course, requires that I go out of the library, but, uh, but I find that for some of the basic information which I need, we have everything here. Mm -hmm. I don't know um, how much how much time you have, or if you want to even wait for another um, time f for a, a subsequent interview, or how many times you know we can have as many sessions as as you'd like, um, but. Um, would you would you rather wait to even have another session just talking about your ethnomusicological work or? Um, well, it depends uh, whether you have the time. It's mm -hmm. now. Yeah, it's about it's um, about quarter after now. Yeah. Um, right. But maybe we could just go through s some general stuff, and then maybe if we decide later on yeah. to to get some more um, um, information. Yeah. Also, I've just been curious about. Um, when you started playing the violin, and and how that that got started in some of your your um, early musical training. Well, um, again, uh, <clears throat> when uh, you are a young kid, you um, you you do not have a, a very definite idea of of uh, <clears throat> what kind of uh, musical instruments you would like to play and, and, and develop it. So when I was um, a youngster, I started the violin relatively late in my age, mainly because um, uh, I had too much uh, uh, 
problems with my tonsils every <laughs> every year <laughs> um i had some um colds or whatnot and so uh, I was seemingly not strong enough to uh, hold the violin uh, for a sufficient period of time, and my uh, and the teacher whom my parents sent me tested me on that account, and so I started to play the violin. I think I was eight and a half. Other kids by that time uh, played a Mendelssohn concerto or something yeah. like that. Um, uh, but then um, um, I had a very, very fine teacher uh, and um, in my own hometown and, and, and we have been working together uh, for 10 years I, w I was with her uh, and she uh, developed me very nicely and gradually it was a, it was a woman who was um, a product of the uh, music academy in Budapest with an outstanding teacher. So, so what um, was her name? Uh, pardon me? Who was your teacher's name? Uh, uh, her name was uh, Mrs. Gabor, Gabriel, to uh -huh. say. And, and uh, um, uh, she played in the uh, uh, local orchestra and she had a large uh, number of students and she was uh, a faculty member of a, a private school, actually. I should say something about uh, uh, my hometown, which um, on the map seems uh, like a little southern provincial town close to the Yugoslavian border on the river of Tisa. Um, and um, it's uh, easy probably to go in and get out very quickly because uh, it, it, but it was actually an, a very old historical city. It was uh, already used by the Romans uh, as a port for salt, importing salt to uh, that part of, of Europe. And then it gradually um, developed. It was uh, an agricultural city with farms in the background and villages in the background. And then it, it got a university. Uh, uh, which uh, received quite a, a notori notoriety uh, when two of its professors got the Nobel Prize. One was uh, Professor Albert St. Georgi, who, uh, who is probably best known here in the United States as the uh, discoverer of vitamin C. Uh, and the other one was a Professor Rees, who has been a mathematician and whose uh, achievements I can't tell you because it's beyond my own comprehension. But then uh, it was a university with, with uh, medical school, law schools and everything and, and it was uh, <clears throat> a very fine, very strict school. Uh, what was the name the, of that university? Pardon me? What was the name of that university? Uh, it was originally called Franz Joseph University, named after the Emperor of Franz Joseph. Uh -huh. Later it became the University of Szeged. Uh, it had, as, as a matter of fact, it had a sort of a uh, curious history when, um, well, the history is political, so I don't want to go into that. Sure. It's, uh, uh, because I want to rather talk about, about the music mm -hmm. uh, in the town. Um, so to understand the musical atmosphere uh, in this this uh, little town, which is about the size of Princeton, I would say, mm -hmm. um, uh, you have to see the people who have been in important position in music. There was uh, a private school, uh, a music school, uh, led by uh, Mr. Boranyi. Turned out to be that he has been a student of Busoni. Wow. Uh, I learned that uh, on a visit here uh, to um, uh, Boston and uh, a talk and, and, and a little conversation with uh, the Waltham professor Irving Botke, who was mm -hmm. also a, a Busoni student, wow. and the two were colleagues. And he asked me immediately whether I did knew Barani. Uh, of course I did. Well, Barani was also the teacher of the pianist Vashari, uh, who has made quite a number of recordings lately mm -hmm. and, and uh, is taking up now conducting. 
So he established a private school and then there was a, a, a city school, a city music school where many of the graduates of uh, Budapest came and was, were teaching. Both were striving. My teacher was in the Baranyi school. When Baranyi got a position uh, in, um, uh, in another town in Hungary to be the director of one of the city schools, uh, then the school folded. But his students have been uh, handed over to uh, Georgi Sandor, the pianist. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and he came down from Budapest twice uh, a week or, or was teaching people twice a week. Um, and uh, also added uh, quite considerably to, to the city's musical life with, with concerts, recitals, appearances with the orchestra. Then uh, we had a conductor uh, uh, who led the Philharmonia. The Philharmonia was nothing uh, of a great, or not a first-rate orchestra, but it was an orchestra. It was composed uh, of a military band who provided the, the uh, 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 brass and woodwinds, um, and then the string teachers uh, of uh, the different conservatories, and some good amateur players who could fill up. So it mm -hmm. was about an orchestra of 60, 65 member size. And it had uh, something like four or five concerts in a year. And the uh, conductor the, who had been engaged um, during my um, time was uh, Ferenc Fritschai, who have been later on become uh, the conductor of Rias Berlin and has quite a number of recordings. Probably we have in our mm -hmm. own library also a number of his recordings. Was a very, very fine man, came from um, a long row of military conductors from the uh, austro Habsburg dynasty. His father was a military conductor and all his brothers were military conductors, but he had a thorough training. Uh, uh, in Budapest and uh, was a very, very gifted young man. He also was my very first teacher for composition, harmony and composition. And then uh, because my father, who was a, a physician, uh, uh, had treated him uh, and never accepted any remuneration, he decided to, uh, uh, to teach me as an uh, 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 sort of an, an, uh, to pay back uh, the services. So that's how you the, got uh, started. And mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, even the old Fritschai who came and visited uh, decided that he wants to come and, and teach me. Now the old man was a typical military man, you know. He was, uh, he was uh, uh, on discipline. Uh, and I never will forget him that during the summer months when he came and visited his son, uh, he came over three times a week uh, in order to instruct me in technique. And instead of going to the river and, and enjoy the summer, I had to stay home and play technique with him for three hours. I hated every minute of it. <laughs> uh, but, but he was standing there and, and like a strict military conductor, I had to follow the discipline. Lately, I, I look at back at that and I think it was useful, whatever he has been doing. But the young uh, Fritscher, he was a, 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 not at all a military, he was a, a lead, a good humanist, and he had uh, introduced great things in, in, with that orchestra. And, and as a matter of fact, I played as a young kid, I played the last stand of the second violin with, uh, with him, uh, uh, and we had people like Bartok who came and performed for the first time his second piano concerto and many other people who came. Mm -hmm. We had also internationally known guest conductors who came and played the uh, orchestra, Dobrovin, and uh, Defoe, Defoe uh, who has been then later on after World War II a conductor for a short while of the Chicago Symphony. Uh, he was a guest conductor. Then we had during the summer summer festivals, which uh, my mother uh, was uh, instrumental of arranging it. After um, visiting Salzburg and see how um, uh, the Salzburg festivals had been placed in front of the dome and in a square which was surrounded by buildings, we had a similar situation uh, with a huge big dome 
and with a bishop's palace which sort of formed a natural uh, closed in circle but it was about six times as big as the Salzburg festival and from the 19 early 1930s there were important summer festivals for several weeks and during the summer festival the Budapest opera came with the with the uh, Budapest Philharmonia uh, to uh, uh, to play um, operatic performances. The Milano Scala came twice uh, with Turandot and um, uh, Mascagni came to conduct the Cavalleria Rusticana and I remember still playing under Mascagni wow. which dates me um, and I can tell you that uh, he didn't hear a single sound what the orchestra was playing. He was by that time that there. Uh, uh, and Fritschai was conducting in the back uh, in order to keep the orchestra together. And then, of course, great performances were, uh, were uh, during, during the summer festivals organized. My mother um, was, um, became actually a journalist and a, a quite a celebrated journalist because um, she wrote in the early 1920s already the first great praising articles of Bartók and Kodai at the wow. time uh, when, uh, when Bartók and Kodai were still fighting for recognition. Her articles are today reprinted in, in important books which show uh, the history of Bartók and Kodai and the first appreciation of their music. Are any of those uh, translated in English? Uh, they are not translated in English, and I didn't translate them, but yeah. I should actually, because they are very beautifully written and they are very interesting. But I have the uh, publications which, which uh, uh, reserve these articles. Her entire uh, row of articles, which represents something like 20 years of, of music in hometown, is now um, preserved in the uh, museum of um, Seged, which was a very good little museum. So um, uh, I probably inherited my musical inclinations from my mother because my father as a physician could only handle the radio and mm. nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> so what instrument did your mother play? Uh, she was a pianist uh -huh. and, and she studied with one of Dr. Nani's students who became an organist in my hometown. Uh, and of course, in our house, we had always uh, musical guests, whoever came to town uh, from the outside uh, was invited at least for dinner or something like that. And I, I was always around and I have met many, many people. Um, then we had um, a an, an guest, uh, uh, guest uh, artist series of of 10 concerts in a year in one of the halls. Um, and among these artists were again the top performers. So I, I heard um, <clears throat> at the time young Heifetz and Piatti Gorski and Milstein mm -hmm. coming to town, mm -hmm. Corto, uh, mm -hmm. Bachhaus, uh, and, and the great pianists, you know, and the great singers of the time. Uh, they were all appearing in one of these concerts. So when we compare the musical life in that little town, <laughs> and I, many times I'm comparing the musical life uh, with my wife who, who was brought up in Chicago, there was practically no difference. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I heard more frequently uh, <clears throat> Corto performing mm -hmm. uh, in recitals uh, in my hometown than she did hear it in Chicago. Wow. So uh, uh, we had a, a very, very lively uh, music at the time in the 1930s. Wow. Um, and then in addition, of course, there were all these amateur uh, musicians uh, who were in business but played the cello or the violin and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And from early age on, I was uh, called in to play with them chamber music, the string quartets, first, second violin, then eventually I graduated to play first violin, was permitted. Um, and so over the years, every summer, we had one evening at the, uh, where we played chamber music on a set day. Over the years, I learned 
uh, all the Beethoven quartets, uh, a great number of the Haydn quartets, Mozart quartets, Brahms and Schumann quartets, uh, just by, by reading. So before, before I even came to Budapest to get my professional training, I had sort of a very nice rounded uh, musical background. Had and you played the Bartok quartets before then? No, I, the Bartok quartets were not uh, not fa not completely written yet. At yeah. The time. yeah. But had you done it? it w there were some that had been composed by that time. Yeah, but, uh, well, uh, these amateur players could not actually yeah. uh, do the Bartok quartets, so we stuck to the classics, mm -hmm. and and which was which was perfectly fine because mm -hmm. there was lots to play. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, uh, this background was was considerably important. So actually, I I finished two years of my academic training while still in high school. Wow. I went up to uh, Budapest to pass the examinations, and uh, when I came then to to the academy in Budapest in in thirty nine, I already came into the third class. Wow! Wow! But that was one of the reasons why it was important uh, for also for me and my father insisted uh, <coughs> being a physician. Uh, he felt that anything happens to my hand, my career would be ruined, so I should actually get some university training too. Uh, and the only place where I could actually enter the university was the law school, which permitted me to uh, uh, to pass the examination, uh -huh. but not necessarily go to the lectures. And That's a traditional thing for musicians to get a law degree. That goes way back. Yeah. Uh, so actually, uh, I was, uh, and and then of course the war, uh, uh, Second World War, uh, broke out, and uh, uh, it looked that. If I'm starting uh, with the third um, uh, uh, year of academic training, I will finish my academic training sooner than the war will be over. So uh, the university provided me uh, the possibility of getting a furlough from, mm -hmm. um, uh, from military uh, service at the time. Um, it lasted until 44, but then after 44, when the Germans occupied Hungary, nothing happened, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing helped anymore. Uh, but up till that point, I was, I was both at the academy and both passing examinations in the law school. And wow. uh, as a matter of fact, I, I got my absolutorium at the uh, university uh, law school, uh, which started out in Szeged and then moved on. Wow. So, um, of course, the academy training was, was then uh, on international level. And the teachers in Budapest at the time, uh, uh, that academy was probably at the time surpassing many of the academies in uh, uh, Europe because it had on the faculty uh, Dohnani, who was the director and the teacher for piano, uh, and uh, some, of, um, some of his colleagues, uh, uh, who were all outstanding pianists and teachers, and some of his dis younger disciples, like uh, 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 Bela, uh, Bela Nagy, who have been uh, here at uh, Boston University, Dohnani student, um, and um, uh, in, in the violin, we had an outstanding school established by uh, Eugene Hubai, Yenu Hubai, mm -hmm. uh, and his disciples, um, who, who followed my teacher was Zaturetsky, uh, and for chamber music my teacher was um, Imre Waldboer, uh, to whom the first quartet of B. Bartok was dedicated and, and, and who played such a very, very important role in Bartok's career, uh, early career, uh, both as a, as a performer of his works as well as a chamber music uh, player with whom Bartok played many, many times. Uh, and then uh, the greatest of all, Leo Weiner, who has been teaching chamber music with piano, uh, with whom we all studied and whom we admired because he was just an absolutely fantastic musician. Uh, and among uh, then the other people, the musicologist and, and uh, um, the theory and history teachers were all uh, very, very on a very high caliber and, and, and 
are graduates usually of German universities because in Hungary there was not yet physiology taught at the universities. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the academy was really a, a, a very fine institute with very high demands and we were working very hard uh, and we learned a great deal and I'm grateful for that. Wow. Of course there was Bartok and Kodai teaching yeah. also at the university but um, uh, Kodai was, uh, I took courses with Kodai but he was not my main teacher. I was. Um, Violin was my main instrument mm -hmm. at the time, but I took with him a, a course in Palestrina Counterpoint, which which was one of his very strong fields. Wow! Oh, he was a he was a great Palestrina yeah. scholar. Wow! Uh, he uh, he admired Palestrina. He was reading Palestrina uh, as scores um, in all his free minutes uh, because he was a choral choral composer mainly. Uh huh. Um, Kodai's works are either <coughs> choral works with orchestra or, or numerous choir works mm -hmm. uh, for women's mixed choirs and children's choirs and then a very very large percentage of his uh, later works were devoted to, uh, to educational uh, programs. Right. Uh, <coughs> so um, so that was that was uh, the academy and the atmosphere in the academy, and that was, as I said, the, s the second uh, second level of my education after I left my hometown. Mm -hmm. Did Kodai or Bartok have any direct influence? I mean, when you were at the school there, um, on your interest in ethnomusicology? Of course, yeah. yes, very yeah. strong. I, well, I mean, uh, that, that influence was already. <clears throat> Uh, clearly uh, uh, sensible when uh, um, mm, I was a high school student because my first theory teacher who was a yes, Kodai student right. uh, uh, was also a folklorist, a musical folklorist um, and I, I learned from him uh, the, uh, not only the transcription, the field work which uh, uh, we started out but also the uh, um, uh, an analysis and classification of folk songs um, and um, uh, many other questions pertaining to folk songs. And then of course when we got to the academy, uh, um, we, by that time we, we studied one course in folk music research with Kodai, which was a, um, a rather difficult subject because uh, I was taught in the uh, spring and, and uh, fall semester and between the two during the summer we had to collect hundred songs which he or Bartok did not yet collect. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> by, that time, by that time the collection was something like 50,000 types of songs oh. in, in, the, in, the, in the archives. Oh. Uh, and then we, we had to memorize those songs and sing it for him. Uh, uh, in, the, in the course, uh, and he was he was rather sarcastic about our singing. <laughs> <laughs> wow, uh, wow. Well, one question to to tie up today's session. I was wondering about um, did you have any brothers or sisters who were um, musicians? And just your 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 family seemed pretty musical. Like your your mother. Yeah. Do you have other brothers and sisters? Well, um, my sister has become a singer, uh, and. Uh, um, before she got married, she was actually taking role in in the uh, my hometown uh, opera and and had several roles mm -hmm. on stage. And what was her name? The same as mine, except Kato, Kate, Kate. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So you had? Or did you have other other siblings? No, that yeah. she's Just, she's yeah yeah my only sister. Yeah, she was my only sister. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, this has been quite a quite a session. I don't want to wear both of us out, okay. and um, I want to thank you very, very much for your your, your generosity. Right, it's a and, pleasure. Um, and I look forward to our um, our subsequent session. So we'll close for now. Okay.